Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. My special guest today, the former Deputy Director of NASA, Deva Newman. Deva, thanks for joining me. Thanks, sir. I'm great to be here. Well, I'm delighted to have you. There's so much I want to talk to you about, about space, space exploration, uh, and we're talking about planet Earth, Mars, and everything else. But let's start with, kind of give me an overview. What, what is the, the status of space exploration today? The status is great. We actually say we're in a renaissance in exploration in space because the government, the NASA, but it's really world governments, the space agencies are very strong. And now we have this new burgeoning private sector. I folks call it new space, not really new space, but uh, while I was at NASA, we really, I think we really got the public-private partnerships right. So NASA, the US government, is investing a lot. You likely know we have the International Space Station. That's with five main partners. So it's with Russia and Japan and Canada and the European Space Agency, which is 22 nations, and then NASA. And we've been living together and working together 17 years in orbit, so 24-7. So anyone who's watching is at 17 years or younger, their entire lifetime, we've had astronauts living aboard space station working together. So that's just the start of it. That's what I kind of call phase one, living in low Earth orbit. We do a lot of science. We're also doing some technology development and testing. And the 2020s, coming right up, we're going to get back to the moon. So that's phase two, getting back to the moon, going to deep space. We haven't been there since the Apollo program. That's why I'm an aerospace engineer, is from Apollo. So I'm really excited uh, about moving out, but also for the next generation. Phase three is getting humans to Mars. So uh, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and now we have space station, uh, deep space, getting back to the moon, and then Mars. So that's the, that's the long-term plan for exploration, and it really is a global exploration now. In, in terms of that, uh, in terms of collaboration, there seems to be a very high degree of collaboration today. Uh, why is that and, and how can that be or will that be expanded? Looking ahead, say 10, 20 years. Why is that? I think um, just uh, inevitable. Uh, space is for everybody. Everybody wants to explore. I think every little kid's an explorer at heart. And so making that happen, and it really is the space agencies. It's the governments coming together. Uh, so International Space Station, literally the name, International, but when did it start? Really probably have to point back to Apollo Soyuz. It was phenomenal. History lesson. <laughs> really. So, you know, over 40 years ago, the U.S. and then the Soviet Union, at the height of the Cold War, two astronauts, an astronaut and a cosmonaut, you know, in space, they shook hands. That was the Apollo Soyuz. So saying, we call it soft diplomacy. The world can work together, and the world works together really, really well uh, when it comes to space. And it's, it's space science as well as human spaceflight. My expertise is more human spaceflight, but the space science, when I was at NASA for two years, I think that's what I learned the most about, the 100 science missions going on all over the, the entire solar system. It's really fascinating. Well, there's also a great economic reason for collaboration, too. So you're not, you're eliminating a lot of duplication. It's a very cost-efficient way so that everybody, it's a win-win. You have a limited number of resources. You get a lot done as opposed to everybody duplicating what each other you know, otherwise might be doing. Right. It takes uh, the government agencies kind of seeding these public-private partnerships, but the industry and private folks, they have skin in the game. And we said now with the small satellites, that's where it's just, um, you know, it's just kind of exploding. No pun intended. But <laughs> yeah, actually, that's um, the wrong word to use. Yeah, exactly. We don't uh, like explosions <laughs> in space. But small satellites, communications, and then you move on to uh, much larger payloads so that necessary government investment in the, the new companies, the companies. SpaceX and others. SpaceX is great, and um, they're doing really well, as you said. And then, then they necessarily uh, innovate, and there's competition amongst a lot of the players. So what I care about is that we just have lots of capability. So kind of seeding from NASA, from the government, is the right thing to do. And then we just have a lot of uh, aerospace is very uh, alive and well. And so talk a little bit more about the uh, public-private partnerships and also where you have uh, private companies now, they're doing things on their own. It's a really great mix. So um, from NASA's perspective, first, we've always worked uh, with industry. So it's always been public-private partnerships. We always work with industry, uh, with Boeing and Lockheed Martin and just a number of companies. Right now, what I think the focusing the tension is that for International Space Station, now NASA has, is paying uh, the private sector. So SpaceX and Orbital, ATK, and then Sierra Nevada Corp. You haven't heard about them yet, but they're now 
under funding as well. So just next year, they're going to be the third to deliver cargo to space station. So that's fantastic. So you have three companies all delivering cargo and goods. We're still sending our astronauts with the Russian up on a, the Soyuz, but the NASA astronauts are going to be sent with American carriers, and that's SpaceX and Boeing. Yeah, so. and of course, Sierra Nevada is right here in Colorado. Exactly, so, so I uh, had to mention them. Yeah. So no. got to work gotta with them. Got to give the local guys. And, you give know, the local guys a shout out. And they have an air, have you seen what they have? I mean, it's fantastic. They have an, an aircraft. So again, as an aerospace engineer, love all the spacecraft. But we're going to be able to, when Sierra Nevada goes up to station, especially for the life sciences and the biological samples, we take all the data and then they can literally fly them down. So it gives us a lot more opportunities. Right now, orbital ATK goes up, it's the, the largest payloads and you kind of, you need a trash can too. So after they've docked and you know, delivered all those great supplies, then uh, when that deorbits, it, it burns up for uh, orbital SpaceX, goes up and it brings things down, as you know, and then they have these cool reusable you know, uh, rockets. So that's really innovative. And now when Sierra Nevada Corp goes up and delivers cargo, they'll start bringing down biological samples and zoom, they can bring it to Florida, but they can also bring it to California or wherever. And that's gonna be great for science. Yeah, it's amazing watching some of the re-entry and then the re-entries and then the landings. Yeah. Uh, just really, it just shows you what can be done uh, technologically. And of course, Lockheed Martin has a huge facility uh, here in Colorado as, exactly. as well. We have in Ball Aerospace. Ball, there's so many, there's, uh, there's hundreds of aerospace. Do you know that uh, per capita, uh, Colorado has, is number one in aerospace? Number one, beats out every other state. Yeah. Number one investment in aerospace. That's how many, and so jobs are, are great, yeah. very livelihood. We should also mention Blue Origin as well when we're talking about all the folks that uh, now, it's too many to count because they're testing uh, their suborbital uh, capability and they're also um, looking at reusable and so they're major players as well. Yeah, no, it's fun, fun to watch. Of course, just numerically, I assume California dwarfs everybody else. Or Texas, so, Florida. So California, in, in terms, again, it depends on, we even break it down in terms of you know, which, which part of the space sector. Uh, what I know well is the civilian space sector from NASA side, uh, of course, from DOD and Air Force and everyone else that opens up, uh, you know, that's aerospace and large. Right. That's the whole country. And even uh, Boeing is developing the space launch system. That's the heavy lift. That's, we haven't had anything so powerful since Saturn V, Apollo program. Now, the space launch system is more powerful. So that's what gets us back to the moon. We call it deep space. Once we get out of low Earth orbit, we go into deep space and around the moon, but it'll be the same technology and capabilities that also get us onward to Mars. So that's really exciting. So uh, Boeing is making SLS, Lockheed Martin has the Orion capsule. That's where the crew, up to seven crew are gonna be in the Orion capsule. And uh, then we, that's, you know, that's the that's spirit of exploration. Then we get on with our business and, and get out there. We've been in low Earth orbit. Again, I love space station, but it's been 40 years that humanity uh, you know, has been in low Earth orbit. And we've learned a lot and lots of science and lots of technology. But for me, you know, Mars is a horizon goal. What has changed? I want to talk about Mars and, uh, of course, the movie Mar The Martian and all that. But sure. what has changed uh, much, if at all, in terms of rocket propulsion? So there's some advances. Rocket propulsion, you know, you go solid and liquid propulsion, that's uh, you know, really what you invest in. So it depends on how much payload you're trying to get up. When you're trying to get up humans, we're heavy, and all of our stuff that we have to bring with us, all of our life support systems. So that's typically um, both solids and liquid, and there's a few different ways uh, for engine propulsion. So while the companies we just met the, the, for SpaceX, as well as uh, Blue Origin now, they're making some advancements on, on engines and capability. But, um, you know, Aerodyne, and, and from back from the shuttle days, again, those engines that we had are phenomenal. And that's, uh, if you remember, you know, the shuttle flying, basically the shuttle engines, and they're solid rockets. So, you know, it's a combination of different fuels. I want to talk about advanced propulsion is really exciting. That's more at the research stage. We're making some, some bets in advanced propulsion. And tell, uh, tell me a little bit about that. So right now, uh, typical propulsion, you know, even the, the most advanced we have today, say the Mars mission, it's going to be a two-year round trip. So it's going to be about eight months to get out to Mars, a little bit longer, orbital and cancel, a little bit longer, you know, and you swing on the way back. Wouldn't it be incredible if we could do that in half the time? So that's where advanced research, you know, comes into the advanced propulsion because right now 
any way you look at it, it's you know eight month mission six to a year and a half. It all depends on so orbits. So what, what would change? What, what would if you could be do different? that in three months? Well, for human well being, that's fantastic because but, we we have to worry about radiation. So in the right. technology of the propulsion, we have to get much higher uh, specific impulse. <laughs> so you got That's what it's called. It's the rocket equation, and uh, so you know you got to go faster. So there's advances looking in that and um, anything we. Well, the advanced propulsion looks at ion propulsion and to get a really um, something called hull thrusters. There's, there's different types of advances that research is going on today, but none of those are, are flight ready yet. The ion propulsion, we, we do have that capability. That's not to go faster. That's really, ion propulsion is really interesting. So we talked about the Martian earlier. They actually demonstrated or showed some ion propulsion in, in the movie, which was great. So we do use ion propulsion today, not for human missions, but we use it, uh, we have our Dawn spacecraft, which uh, just um, did you know, phenomenal uh, missions, you're getting further into the solar system. And so ion propulsion is capable, or capable of doing that today, has a go slower, but you go further. And it's kind of like really being off the grid. <laughs> All right, we'll talk about that and more when we come back after this break. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. The Rexal Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbor. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political and economic commentator, and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbor Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of the Aaron Harbor Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. Used by fire professionals around the world, Fire Ice XT Spray is an eco-friendly, easy to use suppressant gel designed to quickly and efficiently stop and contain all kinds of fire and heat related events including fiberglass, lithium batteries, and other combustible up to 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit for use in your home, office, RV, fireplace, boat, kitchen, and garage. For more information on Fire Ice XT Spray, visit us online at fireice.com. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of the Aaron Harbor Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. Join me and watch the Aaron Harbor Show. 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 I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show and keep hope alive. The Aaron Harbor Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. We are with Deva Newman talking about space exploration. So we, we had touched on, on Mars, and I, I'd like to hear your take on when we're going to get to Mars, how we're going to get to Mars, mm -hmm. and who, who gets to go to Mars. So those are three questions. All righty. Uh, and... But first, I want your take on The Martian. I really enjoyed the movie tremendously. How accurate was it? What kind of science advising did they have? So it was great. First, got to go back to the book. Um, so Andy Weir wrote a great book, and he really uh, did his background. And we worked really closely 
with uh, both Andy, we you know, knew about the book, he got NASA advising, and then when Ridley Scott made the movie, we signed something called the Space Act Agreement. So we worked hand in hand because they wanted to get everything right. They really wanted to highlight what's going on. It's uh, kind of where science fiction becomes, you know, it's real science. It's, this is really what we're doing. So the technologies in The Martian, they, they really got almost all of them right. So they put in ion propulsion. We talked about that a little bit. The only um, difference there is we don't use that for, for human crewed missions. You'd use that for cargo, kind of like your cargo ship out because it goes a, is slower. Is that a radiation issue? Well, radiation is that's back to the humans. So when, the, when the humans go, probably the number one, the showstopper, would be the radiation environment. Getting to Mars and then when we're on the surface of Mars. So they, they covered radiation a little bit. The suits, uh, my specialty is in suits. I have a design and patents for, you know, uh, moon and Mars suits, kind of I flexible. I know, you're a bio suit expert. I know there that. you go. We'll, there we'll you talk go. about that, too. So in the movie, they kind of, uh, they, they looked, looked something like it would, but uh, they were kind of costume suits. But, of course, it's, it's a movie. What else? In terms of the technology that the life support systems, that's a huge part of when you're know, in space when you get there. And we have to move to what we call bioregenerative systems. We do need to live off the land. Now, Mars is pretty cold and dead. I think we're going to find perhaps past life, but that's 3.5 billion years ago if we find life. So it's not all going to be potatoes like in the Martian. It's not yeah. just going to be a potato farmer. But that technology in terms of your life support systems, physical chemical systems, air, you, know, you need oxygen, you have to scrub the CO2, all of that was uh, you know, pretty realistic. Uh, again, but right now on Space Station, we're growing lettuce and cabbage and vegetables, even even an edible plant. So in a little in a little box, you have to scale that up when you get to Mars and really have some capability to um, grow food. All right, what's the uh, evolution of our research on Mars and water? Mars and water. Recent data from. Do you know we have seven asset on Mars today? So we have the rover, we also have orbiters, so we're looking at the atmosphere. We're on Mars with Curiosity rover, and people know about you know, spirit and opportunity before. So every day I think, you know, I get up and what's the temperature on Mars today? So what's the status? We know that the north and south uh, poles have ice. And when you're, why are we going to Mars? We should back up. Say, why are we going to Mars? To search for life. Search for probably past evidence of life. Earth and Mars are four point. 4.5 billion years old each. Sister planets. Did Mars seed life on Earth? Did Earth seed life on Mars? You know, we really don't know. We know enough about Mars, we've been studying it for 50 years, that, again, we know there's ice on the polar caps. It really looks, the evidence is mounting, it looks like it could have had life. If Mars had life, something probably ter went terribly wrong 3.5 billion years ago. Today, we don't think Mars has life, but the past evidence. So that gets us to water. You always search for the water. You know, it looks like there was running water. There's canals uh, from Galileo's time. They thought about that. But today, we actually have seasonal flows of water, much more equatorial. So it's not all ice. So that's phenomenal. So recently, we've seen this uh, flowing water. Now, you can't drink it. It's not going to keep you alive yet. It's uh, really, uh, it's briny. It's very high in acidity, but that's amazing that we see flowing water. Now we also know how Mars lost its atmosphere. Everything, you know, Earth, Earth and Mars, they're sister planets. So Earth, we have a global magnetic shield protecting us, lucky for us. <laughs> uh, Mars does not have a global magnetic shield. So the solar wind is always blowing, wind, solar wind, radiation, and it's literally then ablated, it's ionized the Martian atmosphere. Solar wind and radiation, uh, ionizing the Martian atmosphere. Today, Mars is left with a 1% carbon dioxide atmosphere. Plants will love it, but not so good for humans. So, the Mars 2020 mission, it's the next big rover, I'm gonna send, and it has this great experiment, and it has an MIT tie, and tie with all kinds of friends and colleagues. It's called MOXIE, and we're gonna make oxygen on Mars. First time, humans are gonna make oxygen on another planet. So, Mars is carbon dioxide, so what you do is you split off the carbon atoms and you're left with oxygen. Now, again, it's not enough for a human. It's just a, a demonstration because if we can do this at smaller scale. Scale it up. Then, then that's what we're talking about. So, again, we need oxygen. We need our life support systems. We have to protect the astronauts um, from outside. They need spacesuits. You know, you have to be in pressure. So it's really like camping. It's really an isolated, confined environment. But all of successful exploration in human history you haven't taken everything with you. 
that's what we do right now when we you know, camp into space. So we can't take everything with us. So we have to make fuel. Ah, maybe methane. Mars has a lot of methane. You know, so we have to think about things like that. That's where the innovation comes in, demonstrations. Because when we send humans to Mars, you really want to have your fuel depots, just like when you go camping around you know, to the national parks, you stop for fuel. So the human mission to Mars, we really do want to have refueling and have fuel maybe in orbit, definitely on Mars surface. You want to make sure you have fuel. That changes the paradigm. Then you get there, you can refuel to come home. The first trip, probably take all the fuel with us just for backup. But that's the cadence, and we're going to have humans on Mars, I think, in the 2030s. Not that far away. Not that far. Well, just over a decade. Now, we've been saying that for a while, but all the technology, we, like I said, this is really a renaissance. Everything is converging. Is We're going to do it. First, get back to the moon. That's important. That's an important proving ground, next step. But I don't want us to get stuck on the moon. I don't want to be on the moon for too long. You know? <laughs> How long will it be before uh, civilians can take a trip to Mars? Civilians? Well, we're all civilians. No. <laughs> so I think, uh, again, it's, it's in, you know, over a decade out. In the 2020s, and civilians will be taking trips to the moon you know, in short order. A few That's going to be so much year, fun. A few years out. That'll be so much First fun. First orbiting and looking back on Earth, which is, I hope every, you know, I, we want to give everyone that experience. That's what's transformative when astronauts are in orbit and they look back on Earth. started when we first saw that incredible, you know, blue marble from Apollo 8 looking back. It changed humanity. I think it changed how we look at ourselves. And now just imagine hundreds or thousands of people in low Earth orbit looking back on Earth. This is going to be really transformative. And then, you know, my job is getting further out, the Moon and, and Mars. And that'll right. be less people, but we're still going to have quite a few, many more. You know, we have single, we have six astronauts up in space today. So I, I'm really looking forward to when we have hundreds of thousands of people that really get to journey into space. All right, we'll talk about Jupiter when we come back. We're gonna take a, <laughs> okay. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. Join me and watch the Aaron Harbor Show. 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 I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch the Aaron Harbor Show and keep hope alive. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of the Aaron Harbor Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of the Aaron Harbor Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. The Aaron Harbor Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at HarborTV.com. Welcome back to the show. This is our final segment uh, with David Newman, but you also are going to have an opportunity to see our web special because we're going to continue the conversation after this program a little bit as well. So uh, one of the topics, uh, of course, is uh, we've put so many satellites and uh, some things have fallen apart. Other things are not, some satellites aren't being used anymore. Uh, and there seems to be a lot of space junk. Tell me just a little bit uh, about that and what are we doing to clean it up? So we do have a lot of orbital debris, we call that. And yeah. most of it's in low Earth orbit, you know, just 400 kilometers up, 200, that's where space station is. So, and that's where most satellites are. We also have geosynchronous orbit. So that's where it predominantly is in geosynchronous orbit or low Earth orbit. So orbital debris. And as we have more activity and as things break apart, usually you keep a little extra propulsion on a satellite and then you deorbit it, and it burns up in the atmosphere, no space junk. But not everything deorbits, and some go out. And the more we put up, people are talking about thousands and thousands of satellites and constellations. So orbital debris is, is a big issue. Clean it up, again, usually the best way to do it is to put a little extra propulsion, you know, so that you can deorbit and burn up, you know, a non-functioning satellite. 
But as the world uh, gets more and more up there, we really need a policy, and this is done at the United Nations level. So it's not just NASA and China and Russia, but we really need to agree on this, all the spacefaring nations and all the nations. So at the United Nations, we have the Committee on the um, Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. And that's really the highest level body that discusses, and we need um, treaties and you know the international cooperation and treaties and how we're going to take care. But we need to take care. All right. Speaking of taking care and taking care of people, what I, I want to kind of jump back to big picture just for a moment, what, so that people watching the program have a more of a, an understanding of some of the benefits of of space exploration, uh, the benefits of the experiments that we do sure. in space. Talk a little bit about those. Great, love to, to talk about that. So it's kind of uh, dual use. So if I'm studying astronauts' uh, muscle and bone deconditioning, which, which I do, well, that's really related to osteoporosis here on Earth. So all of that science and research that we do, we can, you know, it's a dual use. So uh, astronauts lose muscle and bone when they get into orbit, one to 2% bone mineral density loss per month. These are long missions. Scott Kelly was one year. So then we apply that, and it's a little bit different on Earth, but we look at those mechanisms, those fundamental mechanisms, and then can the same exercise, uh, the bisphosphonates, these are, these are pharmaceuticals, how can we apply that to people on Earth? One of my favorite uh, spin-off technologies is water, water filtration. Since we have closed loop life support systems up in space, then we really need to filter everything you drink, and then it goes through you, that really is a, a water system, so everything, every liquid gets filtered. Well, now it's being used by you know, hundreds, uh, hopefully millions of people on Earth for water filtration, to make dirty water into clean water, uh, medical devices, um, mobile ultrasounds. We can't take our big, heavy uh, MRIs and CT scanners and things up in space, so we get portable, smaller ones. So these are just a few, but there's so many great applications of the technology and what we learn in space. We're always thinking about how does that help humanity? How does that people, how does that help on Earth? And I want to talk a little bit about the Earth science work we do from space because we have 20 Earth observing satellites and we call them eyes on Earth. They're all looking down on Earth to tell us about our planet. The most important planet we have is Spaceship Earth. I say we're all astronauts, we're, we're all in this and uh, it's really critically important that we look at climate. Our space data is critical and the Europeans as well, so we all work together. Science shares the data. Back to those 20 Earth observing satellites, everything from looking at the poles, we're looking at the glaciers, one's called ISAT, we're gonna launch ISAT too. We really have to study, we know, we have all the data about how the glaciers are melting. I'm, I'm a native of Montana, and it's a, it's a shame, it's a travesty, our, our glaciers are, are melting. So we have to reduce our carbon footprint, we have to know about emissions, and the oceans are critically important. You know, it's all, I'm a systems engineer, it's all a system. So we look at Earth and we look at the oceans from our this very privileged orbital view. How do we look down on Earth, sharing the data about the temperature, the global temperature increase. Um, 2016 was the hottest year ever recorded. 2017, second hottest, wasn't it? El, El Nino was 2016. Our oceans are heating up. We really have to take care of the species. So to me, it's all interconnected subsystems of Earth. And um, so it's, we take we have sensors in the ocean. We can talk about plastics. There's just so many challenges. But I don't, people get overwhelmed with the data. So we're here, we just have a new nonprofit, Earth DNA. We don't want people to get overwhelmed with all the data we have. We want to curate it. And we look at it from a global to a local, right here in Colorado, forest fires, all these things. These are the Earth systems, we call the Earth vital signs. You know, Earth is speaking to us. And then we, as the habitants, how do we live in balance with, with Earth? So uh, a lot of work to do, but I'm very hopeful, very hopeful in, in humanity and a lot of good actors and a lot of people are doing the right thing. All right. Well, that's the end of this program with David Newman, but you can watch our web special online. I'm Aaron Harbour. Thanks for watching. Please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching.